Um, a socialist revolution unexpectedly broke out in Russia in the year 1917. Russia, of all places, which was, a, was not an advanced capitalist country, but a very backward and geographically isolated one. Um, although it had its land mass, um, can you guys see okay over there? Mm -hmm. Although its land mass um, was covered in one sixth of the Earth's, was covered, uh, was, which covered one sixth of the earth, Earth's surface, it was surrounded by a world imperialist environment. And this is a pretty cool Soviet poster, which shows, like, I think the, you know, something, it, a, a dragon, like, around uh, a city, and people fighting this dragon. I think that's supposed to be, like, symbolic. The dragon's supposed to be symbolic of imperialism. Um, Marx said that people don't make their own, or that people make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. And that's from the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Um, all the problems that had been transmitted from Russia's past were analyzed in their objective context. Um, and because the Russian Revolution could not make history out of their own materials, but had to make do with the conditions that prevailed within backward Russia, um, Tsarist Russia was considered a backward country because they were still using serfs as a major labor base. The Tsarist government was well known for heavily censoring the books and newspapers, and literacy rates were very low before the Socialist Revolution. Uh, before the revolution, 76% um, of the people were illiterate, including 88% of women uh, who were illiterate. After the socialist revolution, illiteracy or literacy jumped from 24% to 89.5% within the or 90 from 24% to 98.5% within the span of a single generation. So, uh, basically. Um, universal literacy within one generation after the R Russian Revolution. The forces that brought the USSR together only succeeded because of their alliance with the much more numerous population of the peasants and small farmers and rural people. The alliance was correct, principled, and indisputable in the overthrow of Tsarism, but it presented some real problems. Uh, foreign investment in Russia had built modern factories in, a major, in the major cities, creating a compact, powerful proletariat that was able to make revolution in a, in a majority peasant country. The revolutionary workers were, in, a, mo in most cases, only one or two generations removed from the peasantry. The workers supported their cousins in the countryside when they seized the land, estates, and divided up the land among those who worked it. The alliance between the workers and peasants was key to the success of the revolution, but the mass of peasant smallholders was also um, a reservoir of social and economic backwardness. The proletariat as a class is supremely interested in the socialization of property and production, which the bourgeoisie has in fact already started. But, in, but on the other hand, the peasants are concerned with private property and their small private plots of land. Socialization is a process that begins to take place under capitalism. This happens when large-scale manufacturing displaces cottage industries and small-scale family-owned production shops are replaced by large-scale private, um, privately owned factories. Socialism is different from capitalism because under socialism the wealth created by society is put back into society. This is done by um, economic planning. The Russian, re the Russian working class, truly one of the greatest wonders of the world in their class consciousness, went through innumerable sacrifices, faced famine and civil war, Subversion, counter-revolution, as well as intervention. The Bolshevik Party were outspoken critics of World War I and had inspired the people of Russia with their anti-war slogans. And 
at the time of World War I, peace was what the people of Russia wanted and needed the most. They understood that, um, that the one true ally in the world arena that could keep the wolf from the door was the workers of the world standing up for their own collective interest which at that moment was especially strong and rev in revolutionary uh, Western Europe. The Russian Revolution declared an alliance. It declared an alliance of the working class with the masses of the oppressed peoples of the Third World. Um, Lenin amended the fundamental slogan of communism to workers of the world and oppressed peoples unite. It was clearly and unmistakably aimed at the ruling classes in the imperialist countries. The 1917 Russian Revolution started with the February Revolution, and the February Revolution is a major focus of what I'm going to talk about tonight. The year 1917 was ushered in by a strike wave. In January alone, 270,000 workers were on strike. The war created an even more unbearable situation for the masses. Upon the nightmare of war was superimposed the horrors of a deep economic crisis. By December 1916, 39 Petrograd factories were at a standstill for lack of fuel and 11 more because of power cuts. The railways were on the point of collapse and there was no meat and a shortage of flour. Hunger was rampant. The bread lines became a normal condition of life within the Tsar, within Tsarist Russia. A regime dominated by the um, by the aristocrat the a regime dominated by aristocratic crooks, speculators, and assorted scumbags paraded itself in front of the masses. The middle class liberals of the progressive bloc pleaded with, the, with Tsar Nicholas for reforms trying to frighten him with the idea of revolution. The strike of January 9th was the biggest strike um, in uh, during the World War I years. The strike was uh, raging in the Vyborg and Nevsky districts. It hit the war industries especially hard. About 145,000 workers were involved in a kind of dry run for the revolution. The strike was accompanied with mass meetings and demonstrations. Petrograd resembled an armed camp occupied by troops and police, but police measures were no longer sufficient to hold back the revolution. The bourgeois liberals, from their point of view, tried to protect themselves from the revolution by begging the Tsar for reforms. They didn't want to lose their status, uh, the status that they'd achieved and the centrist politicians like Mikhail Rodzienko begged the Tsar to prolong the life of the Russian governing body, which was called the Duma. The liberals and centrists pleaded with the Tsar to reshuffle the existing government. At the time, 90,000 workers in 58 factories responded to a new strike call. The Putilov workers demonstrated with slogans, down with the war, down with the government, and long live the republic. During the 1917 February Revolution, the Duma was, produced, uh, was, was reduced from what should have been a governing body to the role of a helpless onlooker as the demonstrators filled the streets. The strike at the giant Putilov factory initially started on February 18th by a few hundred workers in one of the shops was started over worker demands for higher wages and the rehiring of some of the fellow workers that had been fired. This event took the organized workers and revolutionaries by surprise. An outstanding 30,000 workers from this giant factory set up a strike committee and came out onto the streets and appealed to the, to the other workers for support. And just the size of the factories in Russia at that time, I mean, there were huge factories with 30,000 employees. Um, so these were unlike any factories that I think that are currently in the U.S. right now, but um, so they were very labor intensive. Um, just the thought of 30,000 workers leaving um, leaving a plant and going out on strike is pretty amazing. Um, on February 27th or 22nd, the Putilov management responded with a lockout of the Putilov workers. This turned out to be a big mistake by the factory owners. 
as thousands of angry workers were coming out in mass onto the streets, coinciding with the many working class women who were now lined up in the freezing streets for a meager ration of bread. The combination proved more explosive than even the bombs that were being produced at the Putilov factory. All this was leading up to the February 23, 1917, International Women's Day, and International Women's Day was uh, International Women's Day gave added impetus to the mass movement as a whole. The lightning speed with which the women and young people, formerly backward and unorganized layers of society, caught everyone by surprise. Working class youths marched as the front ranks of the demonstrators and were present at meetings and taking part in clashes with the police. They also acted as scouts for the revolution, being the first to tell adult workers when troops and police were gathering. On Thursday, February 23rd, meetings were held to protest. The protest was against the war, against the high cost of living, and against the horrible working conditions of working women. This in turn developed into a new strike wave. The women played a crucial role in the February Revolution. The women marched in the, into the factories calling the workers out into the streets. Mass street demonstrations ensued. Flags and placards appeared with revolutionary slogans, down with the war, down with hunger, and long live the revolution. Street orators and agitators appeared as if from nowhere. Many were Bolsheviks, but others were ordinary workers with both men and women who after years of enforced silence by the church and the government um, had suddenly discovered that they could think for themselves and speak for themselves. As things turned out, Women's Day was to be the first day of the revolution. Working women driven to despair by their hard conditions, victims of the torment of hunger, were the first to come out onto the streets demanding bread, freedom, and peace. On February 24th, 200,000 workers, more than half of the Petrograd working class, more than half the Petrograd working class were on strike. They were massive factory meetings, demonstrations, as the workers cast off their old fear and stood up to the face of their tormentors, uh, or to face their tormentors. The revolution had begun. Once, revolution, once the revolution had started, the movement developed a momentum of its own. The revolution was like a tidal wave, lifting up and carrying everything before it. Massive demonstrations accompanied the strikes that spread like wildfire from the Viborg district. And the Viborg district was way up here by Finland. Um, uh, St. Petersburg was kind of down here, and then further south was Moscow, and that uh, encompassed the European area of... Uh, of Russia at that time, or Russia. Um, crowds of striking people swept past the police and troops to reach the city center, even crossing the frozen river Neva, and all the while shouting bread, peace, and down with the autocracy. Within a few days from February 25th to, to the 27th, Petrograd was in the grips of a general strike. A general strike posed the question of power point blank. There is a question that arises from this situation, a question directed at the old establishment, and the question is, who is in charge now? By February, most of the capital was in the hands of the workers and soldiers, including bridges, arsenals, railway stations, the telegraph, and the post office. In the moment of truth, the mighty forces which the regime possessed on paper evaporated into thin air. By the night of the 28th, Tsarist military commander Kabalov uh, was left entirely without troops. The massive people's power demonstrating in the streets had turned him into a pathetic general, a general without an army. Um, the ministers of the Tsar's last government were led away to the Peter Paul Fortress. Um, prisoners of the People's Revolution. The workers set up Soviets to take over the running of society. Power was in the hands of the working class and soldiers. 
Power was already in the hands of the working class by February, but it took until October to fully realize this power. The reformist leaders who found themselves thrust into the foreground in the beginning of the revolution and who made up the majority of the Soviet executive committee, these leaders had no perspective of taking power. They were only concerned with reforming the current system under the Tsar. In fact, the reformists fell over themselves in their haste to hand over power, or hand power back. They wanted to hand power back to the wealthy and the well-connected. They were completely terrified by the massive empowerment that the revolution brought. The sole aim of the liberals was to halt the revolution by making cosmetic changes from the top which would preserve as much of the old regime as possible. That old regime, severely undermined, bruised, and shaken, was still in existence in the shape of the economic power of the landlords, bankers, and capitalists, the huge bureaucracy, the officers' caste, the Duma, and the monarchy. The liberal bourgeoisie was so terrified of the revolution that it clung like grim death to the monarchy as the firmest bulwark of property and order. But the February Revolution caught not only Lenin, but the whole Bolshevik party by surprise. And uh, at the time, at the beginning of the revolution, the party was still in a very weak position. Yet, in the space of a few months, the Bolshevik party membership had grown by more than ten times, transforming it into a decisive force in the working class. For Bolshevism, the first months of the revolution had been a period of bewilderment. The most experienced and politically mature leaders of the Bolshevik party had been imprisoned by the Tsarist regime, sent to Siberia, or had been exiled abroad. The Russian bureau, and that's where Lenin was at this time, Lenin uh, had been kicked out of the country. The Russian bureau was made up of uh, Shlyapnikov, Molotov, and Zalutsky, and um, a member of the Vyborg District Committee, V.N. Kayurov, recalled that the Bolsheviks in Russia received absolutely no guidance from the leading organs of the party at that time in Febu during the February uprising. The Petrograd Committee had been arrested, and um, Comrade Shlyapnikov representing the Central Committee was unable to give much direction for future activity of the Bolshevik Party. But by February 25th there were 300,000 on strike in Petrograd. The strike wave had turned into a general political strike. Trams, small workshops, print shops, and all were swept up into the action begun by the women workers. Leaflets were issued with slogans, everyone in struggle, onto the streets, down with the Tsarist monarchy, and down with the war. The troops came over one, re one regiment after another um, to side with the revolution. And the same story was unfolding in Moscow. Together with the workers, the insurgent troops occupied the central arsenal in Petrograd. 40,000 rifles and 30,000 revolvers were instantly at the disposal of the workers. Although they were still numerically small, the Bolsheviks by this time had just a few hundred members, just a few hundred members within the whole country, uh, or within the factories, um, within the key factories, about 75 or 80 in the old Lesnar factory, around 30 in the Russo baltic factory, and the shipyards and small groups in other factories. The Putilov factory, with its 26,000 employees, there were 150 members of the Bolshevik party in the Putilov factory. These were still very small numbers, but with their revolutionary, uncompromising class pol policies, individual Bolsheviks undoubtedly played a role out of all proportion to their numerical strength in the February events. Without waiting for a lead from the party, the workers, Bolsheviks in the factories and barracks, moved into action, providing decisive leadership to the strikers and demonstrators. Their past political activism provided them with the political capital that placed them head and shoulders above the raw masses that surrounded them. More than three centuries of the Romanov dynastic rule came to an end in late February 1917 when striking workers and mutinous soldiers in Petrograd forced Tsar Nicholas II to abdicate the royal throne. The revolution began on February 23rd when working class women observed the socialist holiday of International Women's Day, took to the streets with cries of 
um, took to the streets of the capital to protest against food shortages and high bread prices. This was not the first of such protests during the war, but over the next several days, encouraged by calls from activists in the revolutionary underground, including Bolsheviks, crowds of both men and women swelled and marched to the center of the city. The Tsar, who had taken personal command of the army, sought to return to Petrograd. The Tsar wished to restore his place as leader, but was persuaded by his own generals and a delegation of politicians from the State Duma that only his abdication could achieve social peace. After the abdication of the Tsar, um, on March 2nd of 1917, the Provisional Committee of the State Duma, consisting of leading pol political moderates and liberal politicians, arbitrarily declared itself a provisional government. When the crowds outside the Taurid Palace taunted uh, Pavel Milyukov, the leading political, uh, the leading politician from the Cadet Party, and the Cadet Party was like a, was a conservative party that was a pro-monarchist party. Um, the, when the crowds outside the Taurid Palace taunted uh, Pavel Milyukov, the leading political uh, politician from the Cadet Party, with cries of, who elected you? Um, his response was, we were elected by the Russian Revolution. His statement did not sit well with the masses. As suggested by its very name, the new government's authority was limited, and from the outset it was acknowledged that only a popular elected constituent assembly could decide the political structure of the country. Simultaneously, with the government's formation, the socialist parties such as the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and socialist revolutionaries called upon workers and soldiers to elect deputies to the Soviets. In Petrograd, the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers deputies formed an executive committee which met in an almost continual session. Initially dominated by the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, the executive committee of the Soviets determined its main purpose to be the defense of democracy. And the executive committee of the Soviets extended support to the bourgeois provisional government on a conditional basis. Soviets soon emerged in other cities and eventually in rural areas as well. The February 1917 provisional government headed by Kerensky was hoisted to political power by a groundswell of workers and peasants who yearned to throw off the yoke of class exploitation by rich land, land owners and factory bosses. They hungered for bread, land, peace, land and peace, but the provisional government was tied to, the Ru tied to Russia's weak capitalist